All right. So uh, as we get started, just want to double check. Raya, um, are you back with us right now? Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. So as we jump in just with introductions, um, I'm Erin Vong. I am the education specialist at Voice of Witness, and we actually have three special guests with us today, and I will let them introduce themselves and uh, or actually, Ms. Raya, if you would like to introduce your students if they're feeling a little shy. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, my name is Raya faber Quiston. I am um, an 11th grade humanities teacher at Latitude High School in Oakland. Um, we were located in the Fruitvale before um, COVID-19. And um, I am joined by Damarian Cole. Damarian, can you turn your camera on? Damarian, and also with Maida Pablo. Maida, can you turn your camera on? And they're both um, 11th grade humanities students, and you're going to be getting to see um, an example of some of their work today as well. All right, so we do have a couple slides with uh, more of their biography if you want to check it out. Uh, Damarian and Myra, I will not make you read it out loud right now, but we will have a little Q&A session towards the end after we've had a chance to see some examples of the interviews they've done so far. And you'll be able to ask directly about their experiences as students doing uh, a project like this at a time like this. So thank you to my special guests for helping me out today. Uh, just to cover a few workshop norms. So as I mentioned, I will be sending these slides out, but this workshop itself will also be recorded and sent out. So if you have any colleagues that really wanted to join but couldn't, they're going to get a copy of this video if they registered. And if not, you can always share it with them. Uh, everyone's going to be muted for most of this, except during the Q&A sessions when I might ask you to unmute and ask your question directly, whether that's to me, Raya, or one of the students. But if you want to use the chat box throughout the whole workshop, please feel free. You can fill it in with your questions, with any responses you have throughout this workshop. It is open and uh, we are keeping an eye on it. So just a brief walkthrough of our agenda to make sure that I have a plan. Uh, we're going to start with just a short intro to Voice of Witness and what is oral history as we define it. Um, I'm going to walk through a big overview of activities and suge suggestions for how you can adapt all of this to the weird virtual classroom we're all in. Uh, then we're going to explore the project that Raya and her students have been working on, which is called Democracy Beyond the Vote. And I'll let her dive into that later, but um, it is very cool and it is oral history based and it is very current with uh, our ongoing issues. And then we're going to have a Q&A with both Myra and Damarian. I didn't edit this slide yet, sorry. And then a general Q&A with uh, myself and Raya for any um, more teacher-based questions. So before I jump into um, my overview of oral history and all this stuff, I do want to just acknowledge that this is a really difficult time for educators, for students, for families, for parents, for everybody. And I'm giving as many suggestions as I can, but I also know that sometimes things that we planned, big oral history projects we wanted to do, they're not going to happen this year. And that's okay. I think we should just try to do whatever we can and meet students where they are. And if that means just a tiny snippet of the oral history experience, even in just reading a narrative, one tiny excerpt of a narrative, and we call it a day, I think that's amazing. So I just want to acknowledge that this is not a, a normal time. And even under normal times, things were never easy. And we should just make space and acknowledge that we're trying our best, our students are trying their best, and what we do is what we do. And we're gonna be happy with it because uh, we have to look forward. So just, if you are new to Voice of Witness, uh, we are a small nonprofit located in San Francisco. And our goal is to advance human rights by amplifying the voices of people impacted by injustice. And we do this through our oral history book series and our education program. So the book series covers a wide range of issues. We just released our newest book this week on native voices in North America. And we're very, very excited about that book. So I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. There are some excerpts and full narratives actually published online as well if you wanna read a preview before you buy the book, but I do recommend it. And we also publish the free curriculum that goes along with it. So with every book that we publish, we also have free curriculum that is uh, sort of its partner 
And we also have just general oral history resources, which is really what I'm gonna focus on today, just the general oral history project type scenario around any theme that is relevant to you and your students. So just a brief definition of what do we consider what oral history is. And according to the Oral History Association of America, oral history is a method of gathering, preserving, and interpreting the voices and memories of people, communities, and participants in past events. And for us, this just means that oral history allows us to humanize history and go beyond data, be, go beyond facts and figures, and really think about the individuals that were involved in creating history for us. And it also means that we can illuminate the voices that may not be in these standard history textbooks and start listening to others' voices, others' experiences, and learn from those. So I just, uh, to plug my ever favorite book of ours, which is Say It Forward, which is our guide to so social justice storytelling, another good recommendation. Um, just a great quote from it about why we are still trying to do oral history in this very difficult time. So many schools and organizations that engage in service, project-based or immersion learning, harness the power of oral history as a means to develop mutually beneficial community relationships that can deepen the quality of learning. To make active listening a crucial part of the learning process is to acknowledge power and privilege and amplify the need for cultural awareness, humility, and action. So uh, I know times are difficult, but I do know so many teachers are still trying to use oral history every day in their classes, and it is amazing to me. And I am so appreciative of them pushing forward with the importance of active listening, of critical thinking, even in these difficult times. And so I'm hoping that some of the tips and suggestions we go through today can help you do more of that in your classes. So uh, this is where we start jumping into lots of links, which is why I put the slide deck in the chat so you can follow along if you'd like. But uh, this is sort of just the basis of how we've been dealing with oral history in the virtual classroom. And it's just a simple narrative reading and investigation. And then how far you take that is totally up to you. But uh, if you click the link to, it'll take you to a sample handout. And the sample handout uses a narrative from what uh, our project called the Unheard Voices of the Pandemic. So if you are familiar with us, you know that we do long books with long narratives. But in the midst of this crisis, we have actually done a shorter form series. And it's called Unheard Voices of the Pan Pandemic. And it's available for free online. So if you click the link down here, it will take you to our page um, that catalogs all of them. So in the handout I've created, it is focused on Roberto's narrative that is featured in The Guardian, and it's quite short. So it's something your students could absolutely read within a class session. And uh, sorry, somebody just asked for the link to uh, the slide deck, and I will make sure you have it. Um, so the handout really just goes through some reading exercises with the narrative, and then just start students in thinking, what questions did they ask to get this story? And what questions would I like to ask Roberto? And if that's all you can do with your students is just this thought exercise and what questions I would like to ask somebody in this situation, I think that's a deep dive into oral history already. But you could go further. And if you look at the handout, it does take you further into uh, an example with San Francisco students that we've done where they interview each other about their experience sheltering in place. And they take those questions that they've been practicing in the thought process, create more questions for their partner, and then produce something from it. So I'm not gonna dive into every handout. Um, otherwise we'd be here for two hours and you'd also get very tired of staring at me, but I am just going to go over how we can make the actual interview process easier. So I am assuming that you have some familiarity, familiarity with Voice of Witness, but if not, if you just take a browse through some of our resources linked here, you will soon become very familiar. Um, but something that's worked well for our practice in virtual learning is guest interviews that feature a number of people. So we've been using breakout rooms a lot in Zoom and rather than doing one uh, just trying to jump into an interview. We've been breaking students into lots of small groups and having anywhere from you know six to eight, maybe 10 adults in the room with us. And then they all go into breakout rooms with a small group of students. So students get that practice of having a guest interview, 
of being able to see their peers ask questions and see how they respond and they get to do it in a small smaller room and it's worked really well it does take a bit of coordination uh, a lot of teachers have relied on just asking their colleagues whoever's available at the time and students get a lot out of it because they like asking their teachers personal questions um, but the breakout rooms really help. So I really recommend using them as best you can to just create that sort of small group experience, small interview experience, because it is difficult to do a one-on-one -on -one when everyone uh, is in this situation. Um, I also recommend just grounding your interview as much as you can, especially in this time, it is difficult for students to think really big picture and sort of think, how do I capture someone's whole story? So maybe you want to narrow your focus a little more. Maybe you do the very classic artifact interview that I have recommended a thousand times where folks bring an, app, an object that is meaningful to, to them and they talk about it. Um, but maybe as this is actually something we're doing with an ethnic studies class, maybe you want to focus it on a current or a historical event. So your students can partner with somebody, whether that's someone in the class or someone outside the class, and they read about that event together and the interview is based on their responses to this article or to this reading, this excerpt. And it helps ground the interview in a way that students aren't as worried about creating big questions. They can ask really direct questions based on the reading. And folks actually have something to fall back on rather than the larger story of who am I. So while we have always pushed trying to get as much of a person's story as possible, we're uh, going the opposite direction in virtual learning and trying to narrow our focus a bit. And that I think that's okay if your project is just hyper focused on a specific theme and that helps students get their work done, get the interview faster, that's totally fine. Uh, one other practice we're trying in with middle school students is pairing students for the whole process of the interview. So uh, historically in an oral history project, we may have done you know, the question creating, the interview preparation as a whole class, and then they set off and do their interview uh, separately. But with middle, a middle school class right now, we are actually having the students work in pairs for the entire project from the very beginning of just what is this project? What are we doing? What examples are we reading? And all the way through to adapting their own narratives from this interview process. So uh, we went this way for middle schoolers in particular because they were feeling very um, isolated and they didn't feel like they had opportunities to really chat with friends, dive into their lives with friends. So now we're pairing them up to work together from start to finish. And the handout I've linked here is a work in progress because the class is ongoing. But you can see um, the questions we've created and how we've laid it out so that students will be working in pairs and rather than a formal interview process, they're answering questions together. And this prompts them to come up with responses based on something their partner has said. Maybe their partners reminded them of something they didn't think of. And it's helping them come out of their shell a little more because they don't feel as pressured on the spot, in the spotlight, but they're having more of a conversation and they're building their narratives uh, about themselves, but together. And we're hoping this culminates in a presentation where they will prepare uh, a little slide deck together in pairs where they talk about the similarities and differences in their responses and their experience during this pandemic. So just trying to make things as simple as possible for the students. If they have this accountability buddy, as one of our board members once said, this might help them um, actually hit their milestones and their deadlines together. And finally, a couple, just a couple tips for once you're in the interview process. Um, I know homework has always been difficult and is extra difficult now. So I do recommend if possible, schedule the interview during class time, set up the interview for your students. So whether that's setting up a guest interview and everybody just has the same text to work from or having them pair off and interview each other, but in breakout rooms during class, if you can make the interview happen during class time, it will help so much because students are in difficult situations right now. It's not as easy for them, and it wasn't easy for them before to set up these interviews outside of class time. So right now we're really recommending teachers, if you can, put the interview into your class time. And 
as much as I love written text and it's very obvious we love our books, we love our literary approach to oral history, maybe it's time to just use the audio. And I will say I am personally not a big podcast fan, but I have loved helping everybody make their own podcasts because students in particular really like working with the audio. So if that actually feels easier, recording an interview and just manipulating the audio rather than having to deal with the whole transcription and text process, podcasts have been a great, great idea for folks. And uh, again, a link here goes straight to our podcast prep packet, which includes stuff about what programs you might use and just includes uh, also a sample introduction and conclusion template that you can use with your students. It's sort of like Mad Libs. They just fill in the words they need to intro and conclude their podcast appropriately. There's also a number of sample podcasts you can listen to from classes who have done this over the last couple years. I won't go into them now, but I do hope you give them a listen in your free time. Um, so I'm sorry I'm talking so much. I just wanted to give you as many tips as I can before we <laughs> dive into Rise Project. Uh, if you are going to go the text route, use selective transcription. Don't bother trying to transcribe a whole interview. Just focus on a couple quotes that students can gather from their interview and that is magic in itself. And if you need help and examples of that, our summer student oral history project was designed directly for students. So it was handouts that you could print and give straight to students and the instructions are laid out there. And it has them pulling out just a few quotes from a short interview and then pairing them with photographs and creating a short little photo essay that they could then publish on a slide deck. They could just email to their narrator or they could put on social media, on Instagram and tell a story that way. Uh, we also partnered with 100 Cameras, which is a great photography-based organization, and we dived a little deeper into that process in their Where You Are program, which is free. So if you check out that link, that's another Design for Students chapter. So the idea is students can log in and follow the chapters and actually complete the project themselves at their own pace. And again, another strike against full transcription. Just have students take notes. Don't even bother with the recording if it feels like too much. They can just jot down quotes by hand or type it out uh, as they're listening. And it is totally okay to ask someone to repeat something and copy down just a couple quotes that way. Students have found that a little, uh, takes a little pressure off of them if they don't have to worry about recording and transcribing everything. And really our main goal in doing an oral history project, especially at this time, is just to give students a chance to sit down and listen to someone, right, and ask questions and learn from them. It's not about having the perfect transcription. So if they're just taking a couple notes during the interview, that's okay too, and you can still create a great project out of that. And now this is a, uh, a suggestion that Ms. Raya actually gave to us. Students have been using Google Translate to help ease their transcription process. So there is a voice input option on Google Translate, especially if you're doing an interview in another language, if they're talking to someone in their household who speaks a language other than English. It's not perfect, but it gives them something to start with as they are trying to type out their transcription. So lean on the technology that exists. And finally, another example of something you can do that doesn't deal with text, storyboard it. We have a great storyboard template in our guide for language learners. If students feel like they can represent their interview and their narrator story more accurately and more completely with images, with drawing, with symbols, we really encourage that. As much as we love working with them on their literary editing skills, sometimes it's easier to let them draw to their heart's content. So, whoops. Uh, so with all of that, I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and turn it over to Miss Raya, who is going to talk about how everything I've just mentioned has played out in her classroom with her oral history project. Hello, um, I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer because I'm not very good at guessing how much time passes when I'm talking. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, so that you can see 
our oral history project. Um, so I'll just briefly say that um, Latitude 37.8 High School um, is a project-based high school um, in the Fruitvale, but we, um, we actually have a, um, a lottery system. And so most of our, our students are coming from all around the city of Oakland. And there are some students who are coming from outside of Oakland as well. And the, the way that our founders look at project-based learning is that any project that we undertake should have an authentic, um, should meet an authentic need in the community. And so we think really hard about the time that we're in and um, and how the project can kind of live on beyond just the classroom. And so for that reason, one of the projects that we're doing this year is really, um, it's looking at the election and it's capitalizing on the fact that this is an election year, but we're really looking at what democracy is and how voting is part of democracy, but that there are many, many ways to engage in democracy, whether or not you're eligible to vote, um, whether or not you are a citizen, um, whether or not you actually have any interest in voting, um, that democracy is a concept that, um, that includes voting, but is not um, just uh, diminished to just voting. Um, and so, I'll give the, the students an opportunity to kind of give you some more information on um, and how that actually shakes out in the classroom. Um, one of the things that we do as a project-based school um, in terms of us as teachers is that we have to make a prototype of any project that we are going to assign to our students so that we're really aware in a concrete way of how much time it takes and what you know like what snags might happen along the way so what you're looking at right now is very much a work in progress as well um, but this is the prototype that um, that i made over the summer um, to give the students a sense of kind of what we were what we were looking for and i'm actually going to stop sharing my screen just for a moment and reshare it just making sure that my audio is primed so that i can um, oh whoops Hold on one second, let me do that again. All right. Um, so the way that I've set this up might not actually be the, the best way um, in the long term, but Hopefully, right uh, now the way that it's working is that as um, but over a video. So presidential elections are very, very important and it's really, really important to see yourself within the nation and within the national fabric of um, um, your- And we have them, we have in English and in Spanish when our um, when the people that that we interviewed for the prototype um, speak both languages, um, and um, and the, and the the basic template for all of the interviews was asking folks to talk about um, whether or not they were able to vote where they live now. So for in some cases, for example, Lisa Harewood. So what are this young woman here um, is originally from Barbados, but now lives in London. But because of the Commonwealth um, relationship between Barbados and London, she can actually vote in London, um, even though she's not a British citizen. And so getting people to kind of talk about how democracy operates in their various contexts is, is also part of um, the project. And so the, we've kind of focused on people's first time voting stories, but as you'll see, once the students start showcasing their work, um, the interviews start there and they cover a lot more ground than, than just that. Um, and so I think from there, I'm gonna hand it over to Damarian and Maida. Um, so Damarian and Maida, if you could turn on your screens, um, and I and, uh, and I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourselves and to maybe give our audience a sense of um, how we've been learning about democracy in our class. And I know that both of you guys have expressed to me that you have an interest in focusing specifically on an element of democracy and voting um, that has moved you. So I'm going to give you guys each, let's say, two minutes to introduce yourself and to talk a little bit about the, the parts of democracy that you're personally grappling with. Um, and so maybe Maida, you can go first. And while you're doing that, I'll also, um, I'll share my screen and share Maida's biography. Um, these are some um, bios that the students wrote for themselves last year when we were doing an op-ed project. Um, and give you a little context for um, 
how they define themselves. Okay. Go ahead, Maida, and I'll, I'm keeping time for you guys. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Raya. Um, so, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Maida, I'm an 11th grader from Latitude High School 37.8. Um, so, our project um, is based on, we were talking like about what democracy is, and we learned uh, where it originally came from, and just going um, really deep into it. And so, um, well, first of all, I'm gonna start talking like about what like democracy is and what I've learned about it. And so for me, um, well, democracy started, I learned that democracy started from, um, originally is from like Greece, which where like um, people like come together and they share about their thoughts about things that need to be changed and things that were right or um, just things that did they thought that were not um, good. And, and then from there, we started talking about if teenagers, like if they had, if they could vote or not, and if it's like mandatory for them or not. And then we also went into if like voting matters and it, does it have to be mandatory? Um, yeah, so that's just basically what we just like learned about and just started talking about more. Yeah. Maida, can you talk a little bit about the, the debate that we had around whether or not voting should be mandatory and um, what the outcomes were in countries where um, voting is mandatory? Yeah, so when talking about that, um, we learned that in places where um, it was mandatory for uh, countries to vote, it was the votes were more like higher versus like, for example, um, in places that they had the choice to either vote or not, the, the outcomes were more like lower and they would have like negative impacts on other people and they would mostly be like oh well this is not good i wish i i should have like you know voted or had like said anything but i'm um, just like looking at those like people who like in countries where people are like told to vote or like where voting is mandatory um the votes are like increased while in countries where it, you're not like really told to vote, it's more like lower and are not really helped and are like, you know, are not really good at states. So yeah, on that. Thank you, Maida. Um, so Damarian, I'm gonna move the slides so that we're seeing your bio and then you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what has struck you in learning about the different facets of democracy. Yeah, so um, good afternoon. My name is Damarion Cole. Uh, I am a 11th grader going to latitude um, 3.7 something high. Uh, I guess one thing that struck me about democracy was the fact that, first of all, I didn't really know that mandatory voting was a thing. You know, I didn't know that it was an option. Um, my, I'm pretty sure Myra already said a lot of the stuff that I was going to say. Um, like, I already knew that it started in uh, ancient Greece. Uh, and I guess one, and I guess like one thing from democracy that um, really struck me like the most was the fact that you actually have to be like you can't be in your 20s you have to be like 30 to vote 30 to run for 30 to run for presidency so yeah Demarion, can you talk a little bit about what your point of view is on whether or not um young people who are under the age of 18 should be able to vote 
Yeah, um, I feel like people who are under the 18 should, or under 18 should have the right to vote. Um, I feel like, you know, it's our future. So, you know, we obviously have to be part in the conversation and we have to say what we want and we have to decide what goes. That and, you know, there's just a lot of problems that we shouldn't be facing today that we have to, like school shootings, um, uh, climate change, like, and a lot of those problems aren't our fault. That's all the previous generation. So, again, I feel like we should be able to um, decide what goes for you know, to make sure that we have a better future. Yeah. Thanks, Damari. So I'm going to go ahead and share about two minutes um, of both uh, Damarian and Maida's um, videos. And both of them approached this first time voting story very differently. And so um, Maida did um, a very straightforward interview where she asked the questions and the person that she interviewed answered them. And then it's sort of edited together pretty seamlessly. And then Damarian's interview is much more conversational. And there's a lot of back and forth where his auntie who he interviewed is asking him questions as well. And so we, you know, like we started off with a more traditional oral history sort of modality, um, but found that like, especially when we're engaging in this very um, timely topic that getting to have that back and forth flow of ideas um, really um, enriches the experience. So um, I'm going to start with um, Maida um, interviewing Miss Joy Ward. Oops, hold on. I was born in the US, but I was not born in the state of California. I was actually born in Virginia. Uh, my first voting memory, um, well, the first big election I remember was the, the, the first Obama election. Um, and that was a really like exciting um, moment. Um, but I wasn't able to vote. My birthday didn't happen quite in, in time for that election. Um, so I was able to vote in, in the second election. And I went with my um, my dad, he took me, um, and so it was really, um, it was really amazing to get to do that with him um, for the first time. Um, yeah, I was just remember being like really excited um, about the opportunity to vote. I think that um, probably like that same experience, I think the Obama election was just, um, one that was really exciting, partly because it was my first time ever voting. Um, and also um, just the significance of him being the first black president of the US. Um, so I think that that is a particular election that really stands out to me. Um, I mean, I think the the 2016 election is probably um, the election that comes to mind most. And I think that that election um, was like very shocking in some ways and like um, a really upsetting election for me personally and for a lot of people that I know. Um, and so I think that particular election, um, there was a lot of sadness, I think, around that election. Yeah, I would say that's, that captures how I felt. So I'm just going to pause here for a second and say that we had a basic template where we were asking all of the students to start off by asking people to tell any details that they remembered about their first time voting experience, but then to ask if there was a particular election where they felt like their vote mattered a lot and whether there were elections where they either felt like the person that they had hoped that the candidate or the proposition or the initiative that they hoped would win didn't and how that impacted them. Um, and so th some of the questions um, that some of the prompts that are are behind how Miss Joy is answering. Um, and then this is uh, Damarian interviewing his auntie. Alrighty, it is recording. So uh, 
Can you start by uh, stating your name? Yes, my name is Ebony Houston. All right. Um, this is an interview about like um, voting and like your first time voting. All right, let me start asking questions. How excited were you when voting for the first time? You know, D, I was, Damarion, I was um, pretty excited because I felt like, one, I was a big girl, and I now was in the position to exercise my voice, so that was a big deal, uh, especially being a person of color. So when I was first able to vote, I was very excited to do it, I was proud to do it, and ever since I turned 18, I have been voting every year. Yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, and like, um, so how do you feel about the candidates for this year's election? Mm. The candidates, um, are interesting. Um, are you speaking with the major parties like the Republican and Democratic? Yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like they're interesting. Um, you know, can I be honest, Marion, or can I be honest? Yeah. You know, ultimately, I know that we have the blue and the red party, the Democratic and Republican, but to be honest, Marion, I honestly feel like both parties work under the same umbrella, to be honest. You know, um, yes. so while I definitely appreciate, um, you know, different perspectives from both sides, I, I feel like I, I also know that they all work for the same entity, if you will. Um, so how do I feel about these candidates? Um, unfortunately, I feel like I don't trust them. Understandable. I don't Neither of them, to be honest. Um, but, you know, are you going to settle for Biden? I am going to settle. And I have to say that um, it's definitely a settle. It's not something I'm excited about, right? But I definitely, because I'm settling, I'm hoping that maybe things will shift for the better for the American people uh, with Biden in presidency. Um, I'm not certain, if I can be honest, but I'm certainly hoping that that's the case. I feel like there has to be something better than what's currently uh, in place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think everyone agrees that Trump needs to be out of office. Well, I hope. You know, not everyone agrees, but a lot of us uh, do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I able to ask you questions, Damarion, or is it more or less? Go ahead. Okay, um, I was going to ask you, do you look forward to when you're able to vote? Uh, yeah, I do. I feel like um, my voice needs to be heard. And that's actually kind of um, what we're doing in class right now. Uh, we had a Socratic seminar on if, if, um, if we should like lower the voting age to 16. Um, so and how, what, were you, what was your response to that? Well, that's a great topic, and I love that you are familiar with Socratic seminars. What, yeah. um, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like the voting age should be lowered to 16? I feel like it should. I mean, there are, I do, all, I do honestly feel like there are a couple of risks, like about maturity, but you know, there's like, but like, you know, there's people already making bad decisions, so it's like, might as well. That's that's a really good point. I was going to ask you why, and you already answered that, so that's awesome. And I was thinking the same thing. I think it'd be nice to maybe lower the age. However, like you said, uh, maturity, you know, comes into play. And Oops. Um, so I I know that one went on a little bit longer, but I really did love how Damarian's auntie switched it and started asking him questions. And I think that it lent to like a really rich experience of also getting to see a little bit of what their relationship is um, as well. Um, should we go into Q&A for the, the students? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to ask folks to use the chat box to write your questions. Sorry, again, I didn't edit the slide in time for both Myra and Marion. And then I'll call on you to ask it uh, if you'd like to ask your question verbally. Um, 
we just wanted folks to type the question first just so we can moderate a bit and make sure that we're getting to as many and as wide a variety of questions as we can and they're all appropriate for students not that we have to worry about that in a room full of educators uh, but if you wanted to type in the chat box if you have any questions especially around you know the whole process about editing and doing these interviews. I will say we did do the guest interview activity with these students um, ahead of their project. And I was the guest <laughs> and I talked about my experience voting and they created some amazing questions in their little breakout rooms and came back and asked me them and it was great and it was great practice for them. So uh, I did wanna ask, so first Tanya wants to know what video editing program was used uh, for Myra's interview in particular. So Myra, did you edit your video interview? And if so, what program did you use? Oh no, Myra, you're uh, muted. Um, for the editing part, um, well, I didn't actually edit it. it my teacher edited it for me. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I can't answer that one. <laughs> Um, I, I can answer it real quickly. Um, I just, I just cut up the clips in quick time. Um, it, because this was a, this was a big struggle trying to figure out with students working on Chromebooks, um, what the, the best way to do it was. And we actually, a lot of the students did what we call in camera edits. And I'm happy to talk about that more at the end if people have questions. So Maria to both Damarian and Myra. Uh, what advice would you give young people to be comfortable with recording and interviewing adults, since you both spoke to adults? Do you want me or Myra to go first? Okay, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so I guess it would be, uh, for me, um, it was, I've been really scared to talk like into cameras. I, I've never liked it, but um, during like you know during like this time like I really had to get comfortable with it I'm um, just basically just uh, be pre like really prepare and um, like try to prepare for it and um, that's something that uh, like really helped me like prepare like um, ahead of time so just come up with questions and don't don't be scared to ask because um, everyone's gonna know it's your it's gonna be your first time doing it like as a for me um it was not that it was not scary at first it was but once you're like you start asking questions you're just going to get used to it like not like at first but you're like slowly going to get into it and just you know start asking them um like you can have your paper in front of me like for me i had um like a google docs with my questions um like in it and i just asked the question just going back and forth um while interviewing the person like in this case was uh, one of my teachers um, so that's like a tip i would give just um re be really like prepared like ahead of time oh right um <clears throat> Uh, the advice I would give is just don't think about it too much. Like, think about it as literally just a normal conversation you're having, just you asking questions. Um, as, as what Myra said, you should definitely be prepared though, but you know, like, if there's like times where you are like unprepared or if it's like kind of a last minute thing, you know, usually just improvise. I mean, again, it's really just a conversation. Some like, sometimes I like tend to go off a, off on a whim with these sort of things. So um, yeah, that's really just it. Don't think about it too much. Great, and uh, another question from the chat. What was the most difficult part of preparing for the, or of preparing for the interview. Um, I think for me, it was, um, I think coming up with like follow-up questions because I mean, you you just like don't know what like the person you're, you're interviewing is going to say. 
um, for me, it was just like, just pay like really close attention to what they're saying. And then just think of like a follow up question or if you can't come up with it while you're um, interviewing the person, you can write down some um, questions like, uh, like ahead of time. So you will feel like ready and just ask the questions. So yeah, that's what I would recommend. Um, yeah, I was, I was like, again, it was actually a little nerve wracking when I first found out I was going to do the uh, interview. Um, well, the hardest part for me was like going with um, backup questions. And I didn't really have a lot of backup questions that I had like written down. Like I said, like, if I'm going to be honest with you, some of the stuff I did end up having to improvise. And basically, um, yeah, that was mainly the hardest part for me, just coming up with backup questions. But what I have learned about interviewing is if you don't really have many questions, you can just go off what their responses are. That, yeah, that'll, like, give you your next question. You can just keep the conversation going on and on. That's what I recommend. Thank you, Myra and Damarian. And I will uh, shout out Miss Raya here, who was very good at drilling the practice of follow-up questions every time I've done a guest interview with her. Uh, she did not allow students to say they don't have any questions. They could always create something based on something I said. So as difficult as it was in the beginning, you two have definitely shined with your follow-up questions. So bravo and great job. Uh, Sophie has a question that I think has sort of been answered, um, but if you want to speak on it a little more, uh, how nervous were you when you approached your first interview and what helped you the most? Um, I think uh, for me, like at first, um, yeah, as I said before, um, it was really scary since I'm like a really introverted person. But, you know, like, just as they say, um, just like try stepping out of your comfort zone. And that's just like something that I like struggled with like over time. But I think now I'm coming more of like an extroverted person. And especially since we've been like, you know, um, been talking with like people that we already know and it makes it like much more comfortable and to be able to share and be able to ask questions um but yeah that's just like what's been um like for me um it's more comfortable sharing with like people that you already know and you feel comfortable with so yeah oh um Can you repeat the question? Again? Yes, Damarian. Uh, you've already answered this a bit because you said you were very nervous going into it, but how nervous were you when you did your interview and what helped you the most? All right, sorry, I, it was just, I was distracted by the chat. Um, I was, okay, I was kind of nervous. I wouldn't say scared, but it was more like um, afraid to like, you know, mess up. Cause uh, yeah. Again, I was going to be recorded, but, you know, that I like, I guess you could say I like use that nervousness and like fear of messing up as a way of um, sort of making sure I did better, you know? So, I mean, I can't really give like, I can't really like go into detail about that, but Thank you. And just one last question before uh, we shift over to questions for Ms. Raya and myself. Uh, did the responses to your interview questions help you better understand the importance of democracy? Um, I think for me, um, it did because like at first, just like, um, like at first I didn't really know if democracy was like really important such as like talking about like, you know, the matters of voting, if it really matters or not. 
And I think what I've come to like realize is that um, democracy is all about listening to uh, people's opinions and really like, you know, taking it in and making like, you know, your country a better place for everyone that Um, oh no, Myra, we can't hear you. Myra, can you try talking again? Uh, yeah. Um, so as, as what I was saying before, I think that when it comes to like talking about uh, our like democracy, I think that, um, Right now it has gotten like a little bit like out of place that, you know, with like our candidates and just like knowing about what democracy is like before it wasn't like that. It was much more like, you know, calmer and like listening to people's opinions and what they have to say. But now it's gotten more of like, just it's really out of place now. And it really makes our democracy like not look bad, but just like really out of place and out of order. Thank you. And Damarian, did your interview help you better understand the importance of democracy? Yeah, um, it really did. It made it made me realize how like people see the um, how the current election is going, and like it made me like understand um, a different like different points of views on like you know what what people feel like. I mean like because if i'm being honest with you when i i would when i like heard about biden running and i heard about trump running i was like you know I'm, i really don't want to vote for neither and then like um you no know, my aunt said i might have to settle for biden and i was wondering why so i like did some research and you know as much as i hate to say it he is kind of the better candidate like i might have to s settle for him um so it actually it was actually a really helpful interview and it kind of uh shifted my um my thinking process on this current election so yeah perfect thank you so much Myra and Damarian for joining us today and for letting us watch some of your interviews I know I'm sure everybody has gotten so much out of it and we really appreciate your time today. It's after school, you have much better things to do, but we are so, so grateful to have you here. So thank you. I, can, I know you can see in the chat, everyone has been thanking you and uh, I am gonna let you go now. You can finally release yourself from this workshop, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you too, no problem. Thank you, it was nice. Awesome. All right. So with that, we just have a few minutes left. Of course, timing is always the worst with these workshops. Uh, but if folks have questions directly for Raya and myself, um, please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I do have my email in the slide deck as well. It's very easy. It's just Aaron at voiceofwitness.org. So if we don't get to your question, please reach out to me directly. I promise I will answer that email. And if it is a Raya specific question, I will forward that and we'll get you connected. Uh, but otherwise, if you have questions, please use this time to ask, or you can also be released to be set free. Um, I did wanna bring up, Tanya asked a question about the way uh, Myra and Demarion's interviews were set up in terms of visuals. So Raya, if you might wanna answer that, um, because Myra's interview only showed her subject while Demarion's showed both him and the subject, mm -hmm. and whether that was a conscious advanced decision or just decided in the moment. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm happy to actually defer to Maida and to Damarian if they want to answer that. Um, my, my guess is that um, the platform that they were doing the interview on, that that was just the way that it, um, that it kind of shook out. Um, originally, the, um, 
the way that I had asked the kids to do it was to mute themselves um, and turn their cameras off because then when if you're interviewing in Zoom, it automatically interviews the person where the sound is coming from. But I think that Damarian and Maida, I think they both did it in Google Meet. Um, so if they if they want to weigh in on that, um, they're they're welcome to. But it, it wasn't a, a directive on my part. And I think Hello. if you're yes, go ahead, Demarion. No, sorry, you can go. No, 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 no. Please feel free. All right. Um, well, I was just gonna say that I had did mine in Zoom, and I, um, and I, and like um, I had had my aunt set up the meeting because it wasn't working for me at first. I don't know why. I thought, well, why don't you try? And yeah, that's, I guess that's kind of how that happened. Mm. Yeah, this, that has been one of the challenges, I think, is trying to figure out how to manipulate the, the limitations that we have doing something on Zoom. Um, because a lot of, a lot of the students, you know, like we, we really did want to record the community. So having people interview people that they felt close to, they either lived, you know, with or in proximity to. Um, but with COVID, that just poses a lot of questions and a lot of challenges, even if, you know, the person is your next door neighbor. And so um, we're still trying to figure out the best, the best way to do it. All right, well, if folks uh, have any questions that come up later, again, my email is in the slide deck, so very easy to reach me. You will be getting a follow-up email uh, once I have a moment to edit this video recording a bit, and it will have the recording of this workshop as well as the slides and links to Raya's website as well as the videos that we just watched, the clips, so you can share them with your students as well if you, you want to show them what a project might look like. Um, and just one last question about how this project might work with ninth graders. It can. <laughs> it might look a little different, but it can. So, Misa, if you just want to email me, I'm happy to talk through ideas with you. Uh, I think Raya can also um, vouch for me and my ability to respond to emails in a timely manner. So, I promise I will help you. Just reach out. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, whatever we manage to do, in this weird, strange time, we should all be very proud of ourselves for. So even if it doesn't look as amazing and polished as Ms. Raya's project is look, turning out to be, it's still going to be great because we got our students to sit down and listen to someone. And at the end of the day, that's what we really want. So thank you everyone for joining today. I so appreciate you making this time. And yes, Raya, one. Yeah, I just, it just occurred to me, um, I, you know, I also made a video for the students um, showing them how to kind of manipulate Zoom in order to um, to make a recording that ended up looking more like Midas, and so I'm also totally happy to share it. I I did a a screencast so you can actually see what I'm doing in Zoom when I'm recording an interview um, with someone, and then I have the interview you know what it looks like at the end. And I've given I've given the students two options. So there's the the option of pausing themselves every time they ask a question in Zoom um, so that they're, they're not part of the final video or, you know, presenting all of the questions ahead of time so the person can kind of do a run through of the questions ahead of time. So um, again, I'm totally happy to embed that in the slide deck and share it um, if it's useful. Yes, we will definitely share that out with, with folks. Um, and the program Raya used to create that was Screencast-O-Matic which I'll also link to um, in the follow-up email. It's been great to record on-screen visuals for your students so they don't have to try and follow your click the red button instructions, which I know has been an issue. Um, but again, thank you all for joining. Please reach out. I will be following up soon, but I'm so glad you were all here with us today. Please enjoy the rest of your day, whatever's left of it. Take some time and I hope we'll all be in touch soon. Thanks all. Thanks, Maida. Thanks, Damarian. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.